Hi, my name is Gordon Lautz. I'm a professor at the University of Zagreb and the founder of the Gannett Glycoscience Research Laboratory. I'm also the director of the Human Glycon Project. Today, I will tell you something about how we can use glycans as a tool to prevent age-related diseases. So glycans are the ultimate layer of molecular complexity, but in the same time, they're the most neglected molecules of cellular communication. And this is particularly visible in this COVID pandemic, when even the director of NIH was tweeting about the spike glycoprotein without a single glycan on the structure. Well, the structure actually looks like this, with many glycans attached to the spike glycoprotein, which significantly contribute to structure and to function of that, but also of the majority of other proteins. So if you want to understand biology, if you want to see the complete picture, we have to include glycans in our studies. Unfortunately, the majority of scientists have a myopic view where they focus on genomics and part of epigenomics, at least the methylation part, which is easy to analyze, but it has a relatively little and low amount of information. While more complex molecules like the proteins and the glycans and the lipids have much more information capacity, but they're difficult to analyze, so people stick to analyzing DNA. While the glycoproteome is several orders of magnitude more complex than the proteome, and it is highly relevant for function of many biological processes. And the most obvious example, how genes are not defining everything, are the identical twins. So identical twins have every single letter in their genome identical, but still they are different. And here are two very drastic examples how identical twins, so two people with every single letter in the genome identical, can have very different life trajectories. And this is one of the reasons why, despite the technical success, genetics did not fulfill expectation of science and general public. We were hoping that once we will be able to sequence genes, the book of life would be decoded and we will be able to cure most diseases. Even 20 years after that happened, we still do not know much more than before and we are not able to treat or even understand most complex diseases. And one of the reasons for that is that genetic polymorphisms are very far away from the final phenotype. So a change in a sequence in our genome, change of single nucleotide, will express as a change in a RNA, then in a protein, but this all has to interact on the multiple levels before it finally manifests as the phenotype you're interested in. So it is very hard to understand how changes of a single letter in the genome will translate in the final phenotype. Because big part of information, what is happening here, is missing from the genome. And one of the elements which are missing from the genome are the glycans. So there are structural components of nearly all proteins. So the majority of proteins, at least those who were invented after the appearance of multicellular life, in addition to the polypeptide part, which is shown gray in this figure, we'll have glycans, which are here purple, which contribute to their structure and to their function. And the analogy I like to make is to do these two birds. So the polypeptide part of a protein, and this is a spike glycoprotein without its glycans, is very similar to a bird without feathers. So we can do a lot of science on this poor bird which lost its feathers due to a disease. And we can study its metabolism, we can study many aspects of that bird, but we would never be able to see this bird flying. Because for flying, bird needs to have feathers. And also for full function, proteins have to have their glycans. So protein without its glycans is like a bird without its feathers, and we cannot understand its function. 
And glycans give immense complexity to proteins. So glycoproteum is several orders of magnitude more complex than the proton. Because glycans bring at least 2,000 different glycan blocks which can be added to the proteins. So if you put this into the perspective, we have nucleic acids with four building blocks. We have proteins with 20 amino acids as building blocks. And then we have glycoproteins, which expand this with thousands of different building blocks. And these individual building blocks are not encoded directly in a genome. So the polypeptide part of a protein is directly encoded in a genome. So once we know the sequence of a gene, we know the sequence of a protein. But the glycan part, so the exact structure of a glycan, which will be added to a specific site, is regulated in a much more complicated way. At least for IgG, we know that there are more than 40 genes which work together to make a decision which kind of a glycan would be added to the IgG polypeptide. And actually, glycans are responsible for a large part of inter-individual variations in humans. Glycans are what make us all different and not just copies of the same individual. And we actually know this for more than 100 years because blood groups are glycans. And there was a Nobel Prize for this for Carl, Carl, uh, Carl Landsteiner got it in the uh, 1930s for his discovery of uh, blood groups. But blood groups are just one of thousands of aspects how glycans make us different and how we are different because we have different glycans. And this is not me claiming that. There are strong policy documents by the European Science Foundation and also a very strong one by the US National Academies, which directly claim that glycans are directly involved in the pathophysiology of every major disease. And that additional knowledge from glycoscience will be needed to realize the goals of personalized medicine and to take advantage of the substantial investments in human genome and proton research and its impact of human health. So if there are such a strong policy document, why are majority of scientists still ignoring glycans? And the answer is simple, because this is very complicated. So glycans are nonlinear branch structures, which cannot be amplified in a laboratory. We have to work with a material isolated from nature with many different chemical steps which have to be done to analyze the structure. And it is particularly difficult to do this in a high throughput manner to analyze the large human cohorts. My lab is currently one of the leading laboratories in the world for high throughput glycomics. We analyzed over 150,000 samples from some of the best phenotype and genotype cohorts in the world. For example, we did over 20,000 analysis in the twins UK cohort, which had over 10,000 twins. So by analyzing such well-defined cohorts, we are able to combine glycomic data with genetic data, clinical data, phenotype data, all the data which is available for these people and trying to understand how glycans fit into the big picture of understanding on the, of the function of life on a molecular level. And one of the molecules we are focusing on are immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulin G is the main weapon we have in our immune system. It is attacking all the foreign molecules. But what will happen after it binds to antigen with its FAB region is determined by the FC region, which will bind to the different FC receptors and then activate different branches of the immune system. And the decision to which receptor will this IgG bind is made by a glycan, which is attached to this asparagine 297 in the FC domain. And for example, we know that if these glycans add, end with this N-acetylglucosamine, they will be more pro-inflammatory, they will activate inflammation, while if they're extended with galactose and sialic acid, the same molecule will actually suppress inflammation. So in the same time, immunoglobulin can be pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. 
depending on which glycan structure we attach to this immunoglobulin. And there are hundreds of paper studying all aspects of this importance of glycosylation in, in the function of immunoglobulins. Something what we did is we asked ourselves a question, how different are people in the way they glycosylate immunoglobulins? And this is just a visual, visual example, six random individuals, different glycan shown in a different color. And I think it's very obvious that people are different in the way they glycosylate immunoglobulins. And is this functionally relevant? We know from the example of uh, IVIG that glycans, which lack galactose and sialic acid are pro-inflammatory, and those which have galactose and sialic acid, they're suppressing inflammation. And IVIG, which is intravenous with immunoglobulin therapy, is by large functioning to immunoglobulins with these glycans here. So we can take immunoglobulins from healthy people, inject it in people with different inflammatory diseases and see that this inflammation is being suppressed by those glycans injected into a patient. But when we look at the population level, median level of this most pro-inflammatory IgG glycan is around 20% of the total glycan. But some people will have 5% and some people would have 50%. And then we think about the native, the host immunoglobulins, and people who have 50% of pro-inflammatory uh, glycans, they will have very high level of inflammation. While people with only 5% would be in a situation very similar to receiving IVIG therapy. So they kind of have their own IVIG therapy, which they produce with their own immunoglobulins. And people are very different in the way they do it. And we have to acknowledge that in addition to being different in size and shape and color and whatever else, people are also different in the way we glyc they glycosylate immunoglobulins. And to be able to study this, we need high throughput technologies. In the last decade, several high throughput technologies have been developed, which can reliably analyze IgG glycom in a high throughput manner. And a couple of years ago, we compared several of them and showed them, showed that they actually work and that you can do high throughput glycomic studies. And one of the first things we learned, we learned that IgG glycom composition is approximately 50% heritable. So heritability is a measure how similar we are to our parents. And one thing which is, for example, highly heritable is facial expression. And when you look into this series of the photographs of a father and a son, even if you overlay the face, you see that the face is highly similar. So the facial expression is highly heritable. IgG glycom is on average 50% heritable. So 50% of the composition of our glycom would be genetically defined, while the other 50% would be environment. So what we eat, what we do, what we think, what we breathe, different things which come from outside, not only our genes. And one of the strongest factors which affect IgG glycosylation is age. So when we did, did our large studies, and this is a study of four cohorts over 1,000 people in each of them, we noticed that glycans change with age, and they change quite considerably. These are the pro-inflammatory glycans. They increase with age in men, which are presented blue here, mostly linearly, while in females, there is this bump around menopause where females are first kind of protected before menopause, and then in perimenopausal period, they start to move much faster. And this replicates nearly perfectly in all cohorts of which we analyzed. On the other hand, glycans, which are suppressing inflammation, are going down with age. So as we are young, we have these type of glycans, which suppress inflammation. And as we are getting older, we have more and more of these glycans, which promote inflammation. And once we learned that, we tried to predict age from the IgG glycan composition, and we developed this glycan age index. 
which is reasonably accurate, it can predict age plus minus nine years. When we did it in 2013, this was kind of uh, interesting because we even tried to apply it in uh, forensics, but subsequently epigenetic tests were much more accurate in predicting chronological age, so we didn't try to follow up that route. But what we learned, we learned that this difference between the age we predict based on glycans and the real chronological age is actually explained with the biomarkers of unhealthy life. So we, if we look at the differences, this different high, difference highly correlates with insulin level, fibrinogen, HbA1c, BMI, triglycerides, glucose, uh, waist circumference, and so on. So parameters which show that we are living unhealthy life explain why some people have higher glycan age than the chronological age or lower glycan age than the chronological age. And then the second question was, does this relate to diseases? So we looked at the people with the many different diseases in our cohorts, and the last four bars are the effect of age, and all other bars are different diseases. And what we see is that in the majority of diseases, these pro-inflammatory glycans are increased and anti-inflammatory are decreased. So what we see, we see that people who are ill have apparently higher glycan age than people who are healthy. But this is not specific for a given disease because we see it in, in lupus, in Crohn's disease, in diabetes, in cancer. So this is not a disease biomarker, but what we think, this is actually measuring one component which contributes to different diseases. And this component is most probably low-grade chronic inflammation. So as the next step, we looked all around the world and checked how does the IgG glycom change in different countries or how does it differ in different countries? And we learned that we had 27 populations, 100 individuals from all of them did a fully properly randomized cohort. And we showed that indeed people from different countries apparently age with a different pace. So their IgG uh, glycom is changing with a different pace than in different countries. And then we tried to understand what is explaining this difference. And we found very strong correlation with the uh, development of a country and the expected lifespan. So if you live in developed country where your life expectancy is higher, your IgG glycom is moving toward the old glycans much slower than if you live in less developed countries where your life expectancy is shorter. This is very intriguing because it kind of tells that you are, tell you how much of your life expectancy you already consume. But this of course has to be further validated because we haven't done a properly proper mortality cohort yet. And the question is why does this happen and how is this regulated? So as I mentioned earlier, IgG glycom is regulated by a very complex network of genes, over 40 different genes which work together to regulate IgG glycosylation. And we have mapped this network through a series of genome-wide association studies we are publishing in nearly a decade by analyzing a huge number of people, looking into their genes, looking into their glycans, and finding which genes regulate it. And then the question was, if these genes are really relevant for a disease risk, then we should also see that these genes are kind of uh, risk factors for diseases. So that the changes in the genome which affect glycosylation should be a risk factor for some diseases. So we did the pleiotropy map and we found 94 different phenotypes where the same polymorphisms we're affecting IgG glycom and different traits like uh, diseases like lupus or Crohn disease or type one diabetes, but also Parkinson disease, some dementias, even cholesterol levels. So apparently genes, 
which regulate IgG glycan, are known risk factor for diseases. So the question, are glycans changed in those diseases? We looked into all the available literature, over 300 studies have been done so far, and in a review paper published a little bit more than a year ago, we show that in the different diseases, different type of glycans change in a way which is kind of um, compatible with what we see in a genetic picture. So I will present one part of this story today, and this part is related to cardiovascular diseases. So we did two large studies in UK, one with the twins from Professor Tim Spector and the other one from the Orkney Islands with the Professor Jim Wilson. And we showed that the IgG glycan composition today correlates with the cardiovascular disease risk score. So if you have glycans, which are kind of old glycans, then your risk of having a future cardiovascular event, like a heart attack and stroke, would be higher than if you have IgG glycan, which corresponds to the younger glycans. But this is just correlation. Is this really causal? So in humans, it's very hard to test causality, but we can do it in mice. And together with Phil Shaw, uh, we did a series of experiments which are suggesting that in mice, actually old glycans are causative of uh, hypertension. So even if you put uh, desalinated glycans, these old glycans, into a mouse, he may develop hypertension. And the question is, can we prevent it by improving glycans? So in a paper we published last year in circulation, we show that if you feed mice with N-acetylmanosamine, which is precursor for salylation, there is an increase in IgG salylation. So those IgG glycans look younger than in the mice who are not fed manosamine. And when you put these mice on a high fat diet, they become fat, they develop hypertension. But if you feed them with the manac, they do become fat, but they do not develop hypertension. So practically, this shows that IgG glycan, these old glycans, are causing hypertension in obese mice. Whether this works in humans, we still do not know, but we know that we see the same correlation in humans, meaning that people who have higher blood pressure will have lower cellulation of IgG. And this seems to happen even before you develop hypertension, because in a series of papers we did together with Wei Wang from Beijing, we show that yes, people with hypertension are different in the way they glycosyl at IgG, but in pre-hypertension, there are already changes in that direction, which suggests IgG glycans may be changing first, and then the hypertension develops later. Another study we did in Europe is on the EPI cohort and on the German part of EPI cohort, where 27,000 people were collected over 20 years ago, and then uh, the samples were collected, the blood samples, and then they were followed up clinically to see what will happen to them. And out of these 27,000 people in the 10 years follow-up, there was 508 incident cardiovascular events, either heart attack or stroke. So we looked into the plasma samples collected up to 10 years before people got heart attack or stroke and looked whether those glycans can be predictive of future cardiovascular events. And we learned that in men, glycans on IgG are as predictive, as predictive as the entire AHA score, meaning this is the best what we can do to predict a heart attack or stroke. Glycans have this information. And in women, there is a single glycan, which is more predictive than all other information we have. So obviously, there is some information in IgG glycan, which can predict who will and who will not develop cardiovascular events in the future. So to summarize this part, we have this glycan H test, which is today even available commercially. You can just go to the glycanh.com website and buy this box and do the test at home, actually collect the sample at home and mail it for analysis. And this test quantifies IgG glycans, which are functional effectors of aging. They do the damage of 
due to molecular damage as we are becoming old. And this change integrates genetic baseline, something about half of the change is genetic, epigenetic information, any direct env environmental factors into this single index, which can be reliably quantified. And now the key question is, can we change it? Can we make a decision? Can we do something and then change our immunoglobulins? There are not many people that have been tracked for a long time. And personally, I have the longest track record of the IgG glycom, which is actually my personal glycan age is pretty bad. I'm more than 20 years older than my chronological age, which is probably a consequence of my lifestyle. And it's getting worse all the time. It's practically following my chronological aging. And of course, I try to improve it once I learned it's bad. And we know that it's sleep, it's diet, it's physical activity, it is stress, more or less the normal things which make you older, they also make you older in the glycan age. So I tried to sleep more, didn't help much. I tried to exercise more, didn't help much. Can't really control stress, so I didn't try that. So the only thing which actually worked for me was diet. So I lost 10 kilos here and I lost 10 kilos here and my glycan age actually improved. So my type is mostly diet, less all, all other factors. Unfortunately, whenever I lose kilos, I get them back again, so I'm still on my old trajectory. This is me. For some other people, it could be the sleep, it could be the stress, it could be different things, not only being hungry like this poor monkey, which is on caloric restriction for the last 20 years. He's healthier, but he's hungry for 20 years. So this is me, this is not real science. It's important for me, maybe not for anybody else. But we are doing, of course, other cohorts. And for example, we did several cohorts of people undergoing bariatric surgery. And if you do bariatric surgery, your IgG glycon will definitely improve. For some people, even up to 30 years after surgery, for some people less. Also, we did a large study of following 2000 twins over 15 years. We had samples, three samples across 15 years. And what we learned there, yes, bad glycans are going up, good glycans are going down, but if you are losing weight, then your bad glycans go up slowlier than if you are gaining weight or if you have the same weight. So practically what we learned is that by gaining weight, you're aging faster than if you are keeping the same weight or even losing weight. So what you can do, you can just lose weight statistically and your glycan age would improve. The other thing we know is that some type of exercise helps. For example, high intensity interval training seems to be helping everybody, but not all type of exercise helps because overtraining or doing um, too intensive training can even increase your glycan age, what we have shown in this study of ladies preparing for the bikini fitness competition. Uh, something which has not been properly studied yet, but there are some examples of people taking different anti-aging therapies, which seem to be much younger, like this dancing guy in San Francisco who is 30 years younger, or uh, Joseph Raphael, who is a physician in New York, who is also at least 30 years younger. And these people take different kind of uh, supplements, uh, hormones, and we don't really know which of them works. And this is something we are currently trying to do, studying people taking different anti-aging therapy. There are also some people who manage to be much younger, even without taking any specific therapy, just by healthy lifestyle, but we don't fully understand how this works. We know, for example, that one important thing is estrogen, at least in females. And in this study, which was done in US uh, over 10 years ago, 36 ladies were, uh, their menopause was chemically induced, and then 15 of them had uh, estrogen replaced with, a, with estrogen patch, 21 of them received placebo, 
and the placebo group, so the ladies where the, the hormones were suppressed chemically, got on average 10 years older within a couple of months, while the, plus, the estrogen group did not change. So the replacement of estrogen managed to protect them from increased aging by hormonal suppression. And after the end of intervention, when the hormones restored, both groups were back to normal. So at least in females, estrogen is also very important. So here I would like to remind you to something I said in the beginning of my talk, and that these glycans are molecular effectors. They're molecules which do the work. They change our immune system. And if you want to understand biology, we have to, we have to include glycans in our studies. So at the moment, on an individual level, glycanage is available. One can go and buy it and check their, we call it now immune glycanage. On a research level, we also have a metabolic glycanage, which cannot be purchased by an, by an individual, but we can do uh, clinical cohorts with, with the plasma samples where we have these glycans, which are more predictive of metabolic decline, diabetes, and uh, metabolic syndrome, while this is more reg related to the immune age. And the general idea is that we try to keep people healthy because generally people appear in the hospital where they don't feel well. When something hurts, that they don't longer function, and then we call it disease. And once you get one of those chronic diseases, and the, the name says it's chronic, it stays with you. It never gets fixed. It only gets improved a bit. So what we are hoping, if we find people before they're really ill, if you only see these early molecular changes which lead to the disease, and changes in glycans is something which actually leads to the disease, then by preventive interventions, and this could be something simple like losing a few extra kilos or changing your diet or exercising a bit, you can change those biomarkers. And these biomarkers are molecules doing the damage. So if you improve them, maybe you will never get ill. And this, I think, is the biggest advantage of this glycan H test is that it measures molecules which are important effectors. If you improve those glycans, your immune fun functions improve. This is a direct connection. It's not only information, it's molecule doing the work. And the other thing is the glycan age gives you an early feedback whether something what you are doing is actually helping. Because we all know that there are some healthy life habits and there are unhealthy life habits. But people still have unhealthy life habits because it's easy. You know, healthy living is difficult and the effects will be seen only after several decades. And we do not want to do things today if the benefit will be visible after several decades. But the glycan age, the, the glycan age test can give us subjective insight. What is our current state? It can also, in a reasonable time frame, meaning a couple of months, let us know whether the change we did is actually working. So for me personally, when I lose weight, I see my glycan age going down. So we hope that this um, tool will actually help people to be motivated to live healthier and prevent diseases. And at the end, I have to acknowledge that all the research we do is very generously funded for different research programs, mostly European, some from the NIH. We got over 15 million euros to different uh, research grants and that there are many people in the lab who actually do the work and I mostly do the talking.